Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from Luke, chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? The gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig round it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. So unlike some of you, Carolyn especially, I do not have a green thumb. I've killed succulents. Honestly, it's a little embarrassing. I'm not sure why I'm admitting to it. Maybe plants just don't like me. I, I don't even know. But I can imagine myself as the man in today's parable, walking through his vineyard and seeing a fruit tree that wasn't producing any fruit. Well, that's just my luck, isn't it? Of course there aren't any figs on the fig tree. I don't know what I did, but it was probably my fault. Better just cut it down so I don't have to be reminded of yet another time when I tried to keep a plant healthy and failed. I'll try again later, I guess. Maybe next time it will go better. There have been many times that things I have tried to do have not produced metaphorical fruit. And as I sat writing this sermon, I thought to myself, should I give an example as an illustration here? But no, I, I, didn't, I didn't really want to do that, especially not in a public forum that might live forever online. And when I realized that, I really felt like I understood the man in today's parable. I tried. It didn't work. Just cut it down. It's not worth keeping, and honestly, I don't really want anyone else to see my shame. Anyway, I was sitting there thinking about my failure to keep plants alive, and then I wondered what it takes to keep fig trees alive. So I read the Wikipedia article on figs, as one does, and so I now share with you some fun fig facts that, believe it or not, are actually going to be relevant to my point this morning, unlike some of my fun fact tangents. So humans have been intentionally planting and caring for fig trees for a long time, like a really long time. Humans domesticated fig trees before we domesticated wheat or barley. We farmed figs a thousand years before we farmed wheat. It might even literally be the first instance of agriculture as we know it. When I think of archaeology, I usually think of Indiana Jones, to be honest, but archaeology can tell from fossil records what people were planting and eating some 9,000 years before the birth of Christ, and it was figs. So the tree in our parable this morning isn't some random obscure fruit. It's a tree with deep roots, pun intended, in the culture and cuisine that Jesus was born into. It would be a common sight in the places Jesus walked. The fig tree is not a plant that's been uprooted and brought into a different kind of climate to see if maybe it could survive there. This particular fig tree might not currently have fruit on it, but the man of the parable probably wouldn't have had to walk all that far to find another fig tree that was producing fruit. It's a perfectly ordinary tree like we are perfectly ordinary people. It's just having an off season, like humans often do as well. I also learned that fig trees have really deep roots so that they can access water deep below the topsoil. And that's why they can survive even in deserts, even in areas where the soil isn't all that great, even during droughts, even in rocky places. Fig trees are survivors. So even if the man in today's parable did end up cutting the tree down, it might have just grown back anyway. There's
there's more into this fig tree than what meets the man's eyes. In the ground below his feet, this tree is growing and reaching and searching and surviving. That is where the tree's power is, below the surface, because there is so much more in the universe than what we could ever see or experience. The tree still has worth and potential, even if it isn't bearing fruit at this precise moment, because producing something is not the only thing that we were made to do. And things that we can touch or buy or eat or wear or drink are not the only things that have value in this world. Wait, listen. God is offering something more. Our second reading this morning comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. Hear now the word of the Lord. Come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For God has glorified you. Seek the Lord. Call upon the Lord who is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, who may have mercy on them, and to our God who will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. This passage from Isaiah is such a beautiful invitation into a life and a love unlike anything that we have known before. It doesn't have to be this way. Come, everyone who thirsts, without condition or price or test or labor. God welcomes us just as we are, even though God knows that we could be more than we are, even though God would love to see us grow. There is nothing that we have to do before God offers us this invitation. There is no bar we have to reach of being good enough. And sometimes I think that can be one of the hardest things to believe about God's love. We can look around at a world full of people who are gracious and giving and faithful. People who are quick to help others, to welcome others, to comfort others, even when they don't know what to say. People who are smart and funny and kind. People who can recite back entire passages of books they've read people who invent incredible things, people who change the lives of those around them, people who have always been there for you when you needed them. Of course, God loves them. How could God not love them? Some people are easy to love, easy to respect, easy to value. But if you believed, if you really truly believed at the farthest corners of your soul, if you believe without hesitation that God really loved you, not just the impressive people, the famous people, the groundbreaking people, if you believed that God loved you, would your life be any different? Society puts so many conditions on our worth as human beings. Are you smart enough? 
Are you attractive enough? Are you driven enough? Do you have enough time, enough energy, enough resources? Have you checked the boxes? Have you completed the degree? Have you achieved the goal? But God is not society, and God does not put those conditions on us. God loves you. God loves you. Come, everyone who thirsts, everyone who breathes, everyone who dreams. God's voice is ringing out with invitation, with promise, with a love song that wraps us up into something more than we could ever be alone. God loves you, with or without fruit. God loves you when you labor and when you rest. God loves you when you can afford what you need and when you ask for help. God loves you when you succeed and when you fail. God loves you when you are young and hopeful and when you are old and weary. God loves you without condition and without price. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God loves you, even if you can't quite understand why. There's one more thing that I learned about fig trees this week. They are a shade tree. So when they grow in hot places, they can be a place to cool down and rest. Even without fruit on its branches, the fig tree still stands as an invitation. Just not an invitation to climb and harvest. And fig trees can grow 30 feet tall, so there would definitely be some climbing. Instead of being an invitation to labor for a reward, the fig tree in today's parable is an invitation to rest. Come and rest in a cool shade. You are worthy, even if you aren't bearing fruit right now. You are worthy even if you're not always sure you can you are worthy even when you try and fail. You are worthy, and God loves you. You are worthy, and Jesus came for you. You are worthy.